Welcome to Castle Island. I'm sure many of you have been here in previous years for the Pawlig O'Keefe Festival. Close your eyes and let your memories transport you back here again. We have a lovely concert of fiddle music lined up with a special emphasis on the local tradition. First, we feature four individual performers, each playing in turn. Con Moynihan from Guinea Grilla, his nephew Aidan Connolly from Dublin, Emma O'Leary from Scarlet Glen, and Diamond O'Brien from Glen County Limerick. First, we start with Con. Hello to everybody from the Patrick O'Keefe Festival, uh, Cormac and everybody organising it there. Uh, I play a few tunes, uh, I play a few hornpipes of Paddy Cronin's, I uh, think Paddy calls them the Galway hornpipe. Uh, there's actually two hornpipes, but Paddy used to play them as a four part, but I play two two part hornpipes. Um, I'd like to remember another Paddy today too, and that's uh, Paddy Jones, uh, my friend who died and passed away there last uh, summer. So I'll play these for Paddy. try four reels uh, don't worry the first three are single so it won't take too long um, the first two reels come from um, a collection of Scottish fiddle music they're both from the 18th century uh, the first one is called Cheap Meal uh, and I think it's an ancestor of Lucy Campbell and the second one is called Lady Margaret Stewart after that I'll go into the McCroom Lasses which is on the Jackie Daly Seamus Cray album from the from the 70s uh, it was also recorded by Michael Coleman way back uh, as a Scottish called the Killarney Wonder. And then finally, I'll finish up with a West Cork two-hand reel called uh, the Jenny Borlan reel, uh, which I got from a recording of Mike Hartness, a great box pair from Kerry. So I'll give these a go. Thank you. 
Now, I'm gonna chance three polkas. Uh, I got all of them from recordings uh, that surfaced during the Handed Down series last year. The first one uh, came from John Murphy, who's an accordion player from Curl, um, and a, a pupil of Park O'Keefe. I believe the polka is uh, a version of the Boys of 25 reel. Bridgie Con Mats is the name I have in the second one. It comes from Julie Clifford, 1989 recording. And then the last chance polka from uh, Dan Leary is the third one. So give him a go. In the virtual fiddle concert for this year's Podrick O'Keefe Festival. Um, hopefully we'll be back in Castle Island next year. We remember fondly Paddy Jones who sadly passed away during the year. Paddy was always part of this fiddle concert in the Isle of Leaf in Castle Island. So we think of Paddy and we remember him fondly. I'm going to start off playing two slides. The first one is called Mrs O'Connor's and the second one is Jim Keefe's and it's Johnny Leary's version.
with three local compositions. The first one is a hornpipe. It was composed by PJ Tehan. It's called the Trip to Kilmurray. Then I'll follow that with two reels. Um, the first one is the Rotecastle Island that was composed by Nicky McAuliffe. And the last one is the Heights of Ming Vosha that was composed by Castle Island accordion player Tom Fleming. Thanks. from 
flute playing of John McKenna, lead from flute player who immigrated to America in the 1920s. Three reels. Uh, the first one is a version of Tom Billy's played by John Joe Harkness, flute player on uh, Sean O'Reed as my musical heritage back in 1962. Uh, the second one is a uh, tune I learned from the player Mark Mulville called Jack O'Connell's Reel. And the third one is The Dairy Maid.
Thanks for Con, Aiden, Emma and Dermot. Next I'd like to play myself uh, and I'd like to feature uh, some tunes from Padre's manuscripts. Uh, the first is a story bound on Il Rua. As many of you will know, Padre used a system of numbers and symbols when writing out uh, the tunes. For example, this is the notation uh, that Padre used for the air that I'm now going to play, Ban on Il Rua. Padraig was born in 1887 in Glowntown, a few miles outside Castle Island. He taught music in the locality from about 1920 up to his death in 1963. In a manuscript dated 1939, he notated a version of the well-known jig, The Connacht Man's Rambles. Also in the same manuscript, uh, he includes a polka version uh, of the same tune. Now I'd like to play these for you.
we'll now continue with three fiddle duos. You all probably know that if there's anything better than a fiddle, it's two fiddles. <laughs> Uh, we'll have the O'Keefe sisters from Tralee, Moira and Aoife, Connie O'Connell from Kilnamatra with his daughter Anya and her son Nisha O'Connell on piano. Starting off, we have Nicky McAuliffe and Donald Cullinan with a tune written by Nicky for the cottage in Cordell that Donald has restored and renovated. The tune is called Anuachin Donald.
started off there with a set of jigs that we heard from the playing of Paddy Cronin. We're going to finish up now with two hornpipes. The first is Portugal Keith's version of the Smoky Chimney, followed by Callahan's.
read an issue come canny and shop. Tinna er clean raw and cake can, I was a dark can now, the clear looms for talk. When this concert took place live in Castle Island, a central figure was Paddy Jones. Sadly, Paddy passed away some months ago and we miss him greatly. He has already been referred to a number of times tonight. To bring this concert to a close, we would like to show a short autobiographical film on Paddy. This film was made by John Reedy, a great friend of the music and of the musicians. It lasts for about 15 minutes. In conclusion, I would like to acknowledge and thank the committee of the Patrick O'Keefe Festival for all their hard work, in particular, Cormac O'Mahony and his son, Conor O'Mahony. Take care, one and all. I look forward to seeing ye back in Castle Island this time next year. But first, let's listen to Paddy Jones. Yes, they go over on them. 
The following recording of Paddy Jones playing his fiddle in his kitchen in Knights Mountain in the parish of Knocknagoshal came about as, as the result of a long-held promise between the two of us that we would sit down, I'd bring a camera and, um, and a recorder and Paddy would play his fiddle and tell his story. Um, he goes from the time that he developed an interest in the music of Steve Luker as a very young child and how his parents noticed this and they sent him to, to Patrick O'Keefe who lived a few miles away out in Glownthorn. Paddy left, like a lot of young people of his generation, he left and went to London. There he saw all the, 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 the great fiddle players of that generation. And on his return home, he tells how he discovered the, the record that uh, Julie, Julie Murphy and Dennis, our brother Dennis, made in the 19, late 1950s, uh, the star above the garter and the influence that had on him and, um, and his development in the music sense. I hope you enjoy it. I, my name is Paddy Jones and I was born in Cornwall. And uh, when I was about nine, or eight years, my parents noticed that I was very much hooked on listening to Irish traditional music on the radio. And uh, I wanted them to play the box. My father used to go on the beat, which was for people that don't know, a load of working men left Ireland in maybe September or October and went across to England and worked in the beet factories in England, making sugar out, out of sugar beet. And uh, he came back with a fiddle, a full-size fiddle, and uh, shortly after I walked to Glownthorn Cross and uh, started with Padre O'Keefe. I can remember the first day, Padre, to a nice dry Sunday, it was always a Sunday I went to, to Padre O'Keefe, to a nice dry Sunday, afternoon and uh, Padre made a big welcome and asked would he put on a cup of tea for me and took my coat and hung it on the the newel of the other bottom uh, leg of the stairs and uh, then he proceeded to write a set of rules about holding the fiddle and uh, that was all the rules he ever gave and he never enforced the rules that after that if you did the wrong thing pardon, he might say you know hold it up or something like that but he didn't work very hard in correcting you know, after a while you were left to your own devices it was strictly a matter of learning the tune you were given and uh, the first tune he gave was called the wearing of the green it was a match and uh, he wrote the first half of it in tablature notation Three, not one, 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 not one, two, two, three, something like that. And uh, that's the way I began to learn the fiddle. So I remember the first day I asked him, as I left, because I had no money, uh, how much would the lessons be, Padre? And Padre, with the lovely old Irish, idiom said God knows God soon I won't be too hard on you five bob you know five bob at that time was five shillings which was a quarter of a pound note now a pound note was a lot of money at that time about ten years after farmers were very agitated when men were looking for a pound a day for wages so that five shillings that time would buy at least a couple of pints, if not three pints of Guinness, and maybe 10 cigarettes or maybe 20. So that was quite a lot of money at that time. So I called, not every Sunday, on a sort of an ad hoc basis, and uh, Padre brought out tunes and eventually he came to writing a full polka maybe or something. And his only, uh, input into the lesson would be no, don't play it like this play it more this way you know, we might be doing one, two, one, two, one, two, something like that and he'd, he'd sort of show you how to put that swing in, in it, you know and uh, that was it the lesson was usually over in about three or four minutes except for the time it took him to write the tune which he always wrote out of his head 
on a, on a sheet of paper. Sometimes the page would kill in or whatever paper was available. And he was always on to me to get a manuscript music book, which would save him a lot of drawing lines and things, but of course it didn't turn up for a good while. So uh, things went on like that, learning hornpipes and porkies for a while. When, but maybe after about a year, I began to find out that my journeys were wasted because after coming there, Padding wouldn't be there. And they'd hang around maybe for an hour. And you must remember that I had walked from the top of Kilcushman and uh, maybe there was no assisting at dinner times or breakfast times and no cups of tea in between. So I turned around and walked home again. So when this happened two or three times in the trot, I think I gave up going. And my father met Padring in town and he said, uh, send out that young lad to me again. But I don't think that it happened. And the next thing I heard was that Padring Yorkeef was dead. The saying, youth is wasted on the young, is so true. Uh, very soon, totally unexpectedly, Padring Yorkeef died in the month of February, I think, in 1963. And uh, as young as I was, I was 16, I think, at the time. Yeah, it had a, a devastating effect on me. And that somehow, even though I didn't know or appreciate the man's uniqueness at that time, I felt a terrible sense of loss. And uh, I can remember my father and mother experienced and spoke of a sense of loss that was unique in the sense that they had one saying, and the saying was, that man should never have died. And they only said it to one other man that I know of, down through the course of their lives, and that was Joe Cooley, the boxer. They didn't say it to popes and bishops or presidents or anyone, only Padre O'Keefe and Joe Cooley. But I didn't understand O'Keefe's playing ability or the drift, that's the word he used himself, the drift of his music. And of course, shortly after, I went to England. I was over in London when I was about 18. And I remember going down to Hammersmith to hear Sean Maguire play and, uh, in the King's Head in Fulham. And I remember asking myself, or thinking to myself, what in the name of God was my father talking about? Sure, these people had and now an idea of music compared to what this man can do with a fiddle. And of course, that's still the consensus of loads of people in the world today. Not mind you, young lad of 18 that time. But some time after, I'd say, when I was about 30 years of age, you imagine, passing through Limerick, coming from some place one day, I had a look through the music shops and they saw a record with a very psychic, uh, uh, an old LP, sorry, uh, 33 or PMLP, with a psychedelic cover called The Star Above the Gather. And it was only when I listened to that a few times, and I, I, I asked myself, what's happening in this music? What are these people doing? Because something was happening in this music that didn't happen in any other music that I ever had ever before or since. In other words, there was a drift or a magic, a soul, a story flowing from the the flow and, and the cadence and the rhythms of this music that came from a very deep and strange place and it had nothing to do with technique. Technique might harm it, but a man could have plenty of technique and maybe not harm it as well. But at that age of my life, when I was 30 years of age, it was then I understood what my father meant when he said, when you had Doc Eve play, you knew that nobody could play a fiddle like that. So, it 
for then I began to appreciate having known that grand old gentleman and uh, having handwritten tunes that he wrote for me so I kept that love of the music always and of all the recordings and there are some mighty recordings and some mighty fiddle players. I've listened to a lot of them and met quite a few of them. But uh, if, if I had to be marooned on a desert island, would one single piece of equipment, it would have to be the star above the earth. Because the magic of that never falls at any time. <laughs> Excellent. Do you always hum when you're playing Paddy? A little bit, John, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what does that do in I terms know. of... There's something I can't stop, I suppose. No, but is it... What are you constructing? The, is this the tune coming through your head by different I processes? I suppose, John, that... that uh, you know, I've got no... Is it still on, John, Tis? Oh, Tis? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. A man came up to me a while, playing in a concert, and he said, uh, you hum along with the tune. I said, thanks for telling me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kind of aware of it, but would you believe a lot of players, Andy McGann used to, mm -hmm. that I was amazed one time I had a recording of Andy, a, 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 a cassette recording, and I thought there was somebody at the door from the noise that was happening. Mm -hmm. I went out to the door, but Andy had that same habit of, of a lot of fellas do for some reason, you know, John, that it's somehow our our inner brain is tuned to the f to the, 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 the pitch of the notes, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yes. Somehow, you know, maybe yes. That's, that's something, you know. Well, at least it's in tune. <laughs> yeah, well, it should be. 